So I'd like to welcome you, Rolando, to this interview. Um, this is the first in a series of interviews for the Bounce Forward Project, and you know we're going. I'm going all over the United States and interviewing people that have amazing stories that are inspirational, that are motivational, people that have overcome challenges, and really the whole purpose behind. This interview is first to have fun because we're going to have okay. a lot of fun. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> that's, that's the easy part. And, and also just to be able to inspire people, people that are um, maybe facing challenges of their own, like, you know, give, yeah. give some advice on how um, and perspective on how to uh, the challenges you've overcome in your life, you know, and, and maybe some insight that can help somebody along the way. So I'm, I'd like to go ahead and first introduce you and then you can correct me okay. if anything's wrong here. But I think, okay. I, I think I got it down here pretty good. Uh, a little bit about your background, and um, and we'll jump right into it. Alrighty. So Rolando Chang Chang Barrio is Barrero. a Barrero. <laughs> so we're, we're starting off correct. Starting off correct. <laughs> Rolando Barrero, I like that. Is a painter, performance artist, activist, and arts activist activist based in West Palm Beach, Florida. Yes. He, he's a graduate of the School of Art Institute of Chicago in 1990, where he was awarded the Ryerson Fellowship. Mm -hmm. Uh, recent inv invitational engagements include the Ringling Museum and the Norton Museum of Art. Recently awarded the Cultural Council of Palm Beach Muse Award for Outstanding Cultural Leadership and named the Best Artist in Palm Beach by SFGN. Uh, Rolando is a multimedia artist with a portfolio including fashion design, video, film, painting, sculpture, acting, and performance art. Uh, what don't you do? Um, <laughs> Rolando has been creating work for over 40 years. Um, another area of the, your life that's very important to you is activism and politics. Um, you've, this has been a central theme to your work. Also climate change. So uh, uh, I would say causes such as climate change, the AIDS epidemic, brain cancer, recovery from addiction, uh, the intersections of race, ethnicity, gender, and sexuality play key roles in the development of your work. That That's a right? mouthful. How did you, I, <laughs> no wonder you had to read it. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't quite memorize all that. Um, so, you know, basically, um, in, in, in one word, it's I, I deal with my autobiography. I, I'm writing an autobiography. Okay. Everything that that I touch, and I think it's true for you, uh, mm -hmm. as well as almost everybody else. That um, it's just autobiography. Uh, it's just a reflection of your experiences. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, when you're a little bit over half a century old, all of these things um, get incorporated somehow. They're, they become syncretic uh, as one. So you can't do one thing um, excluding something else because you're, that is, is always lingering in your body. Um, mm -hmm. As you know, we, we are... We could be here in uh, in Tampa and in St. Pete, but you bring Europe with you when mm. you when you right. that experience never leaves you. So it's fresh eyes, new eyes, different different ways of manifesting things. So the, the, all of that it just means autobiography. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Um, so I guess. Um, I definitely want to talk about the present and future a lot with you, like what's important to you now. We're going to get into a lot of that yeah. and what you're working on because it, um, some of the causes that you're working on are very much resonate with me and I think they'll resonate with our audience. And uh, But speaking to your point you just made, you know, it's the events, a lot of the events in our life, they obviously shape us. Right. They shape the way that we think, the way that we view the world. And um, so I guess just in... Uh, Let's catch the audience up kind of like with what brought you to this point where you're at today. Um, like, what are some key experiences in your life that kind of have shaped your views and brought you to this point? Well, um, um, starting backwards? Yeah, let's go, let's go back. Backwards, uh, one of my closest friends just passed last week uh, from uh, COVID-19. Uh, me and him shared a stage not too long ago, uh, having been recognized as legacies uh, in the LGBT community. Um, two weeks before that, we buried my uh, um, my sister's mother-in-law, which was uh, a dear friend of the family's and uh, one of the three matriarchs. Um, in 
a week prior to that, my mother passed away. Mm -hmm. uh, a couple of weeks before that, uh, another uh, caretaker for the family uh, had passed away. Uh, so, you know, the, it, in life, as you, you get older, um, you're confronted with a lot more cathartic um, situations and no one's ever prepared for anything um, because it's always new. Um, and you can go through the normal cycles, um, but sometimes it just gets to that point where you have to decide, am I going to go over the edge? Is it too much? Mm -hmm. Or do I get to look at it through fresh eyes? And mm -hmm. I was explaining to you, uh, we have just in our country uh, passed a, a point where divisiveness, separatism had been in the news, disease, death mm -hmm. had been yeah. so overwhelming. Yeah. Um, and I reached my, my peak when um, my mother passed uh, to COVID without any contact, without anything, uh, which is very typical of uh, people who pass due to COVID-19. Um, and I really didn't know if I was going to make it through that day. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. and people started sending me notes and the cards arrived and the flowers arrived. Um, and I stopped and I thought, let me count, um, the number of cards, the number of notes, social media, Instagram, Facebook, uh, actual cards that arrived in the mail, uh, mm -hmm. the flowers being sent. And I was like, that's, I have over a thousand people oh, wow. that are yeah. generating goodwill, mm -hmm. that are generating empathy. And it never occurred to me that for the whole year I was saying people lack empathy. Mm. Um, he was an amazing not, example of and I wasn't, and I wasn't seeing it. Wow! And it, and it, and it took a really serious situation, like my my mom passing, mm -hmm. for me to to notice that I live in the world that I mm -hmm. that I was asking for. Um, and since for I think a couple of days after that, you called and mm -hmm. and and said. You know, uh, we want to talk about how you overcome things. And I was like, I remember that conversation, and, you know, uh, the energy, the, this, how much we resonated on yeah. this topic. Yeah, because I, yeah, I think we're trained by um, by what we're exposed to mm -hmm. and to react. Mm -hmm. um, and it's OK. It's natural. But we also need to step back and and analyze what is the event. Mm -hmm. Basically, the event was that someone died of COVID. Yeah. Um, it just happened to be my mother and a couple of closer friends of mine. Um, the rest of it is uh, what I make up. Yeah. My interpretation of the event, my emotionalism, yeah. my sentimentality towards the event, and whether I am going to be able to, to focus that sentimentality, that emotionalism, into something that could generate mm -hmm. um, a positive right. uh, example for other people. Mm -hmm. um, I received the empathy, I noticed it. So I'm like reminding myself when someone passes, mm -hmm. you know, comfort them the same way. Because mm -hmm. um, I, re I really want to go on TV and talk about the governor and, and this and that and how the COVID thing and the responsibility. Mm -hmm. But that does nothing to help people heal, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, it may circumvent and stop the prolification of the issue, yeah. um, but those are human beings that are suffering. Mm -hmm. And what are we doing to reach out to them? And that's been uh, a new mission of mine now yeah. uh, to start off some support groups like that. You, uh, a lot of your work talks, um, focuses on, I want to read a quote that you shared. Um, uh, oh no, which one? <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> because <laughs> I think this has, uh, this feeds right into this, but um, you know, 
you, you said this recently. You said, I celebrate other people. I enjoy the idea of having a vibrant world around me. Yeah. You said, the art world gallery offers me that. A lot of free thinking, abstract thinking. Um, and, you know, when we were talking on the phone, one of the things that struck me about you is how open you are to listening you, you, to listening to others. Right. How important do you think that is in our society? And do you think that that's the fact that we struggle so much listening to each other mm -hmm. is a big part of a lot of the challenges that we're facing that we see politically and so on and so forth. Like the, just the lack of, of basic human empathy and right. listening. Right. And, and that, that, that goes back to, uh, let's say for an example, they say, oh, uh, we didn't know how to message to someone. Um, you don't know how to message to someone because you're not learning them. You're not listening to them, and there's a book the, by Chapman called The Love Languages, Five Love Languages. Oh, I've read that book. And, book. and that is the basis yeah. of, of a lot of how I live my life. Okay. It's like I try to learn people mm. um, and try to listen to how they respond to life. Mm. I respond in a real uh, New York way, just straight out, tell me what, what's there, mm -hmm. uh, and I have no time because I'm always going, 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 mm -hmm. uh, say yes or no. Mm -hmm. uh, other people um, learn, teach, and understand and express love differently. And I've, I'm at a point now, um, I, as you know, I'm a cancer survivor. Mm -hmm. So when I came back to work 10 years ago, I was more concerned not with making money, not with, well, and I have made money, mm -hmm. uh, and not necessarily having an empire in the arts and making a big impact, um, although that's been somewhat of, uh, of a byproduct also. Right. Mine was to make sure that I left the legacy behind and to be the best ally uh, for a community. Um, my current exhibition gives voice, gives a space to the voices of the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, people say, what is your position on it? My position is that it needs to be documented, it needs to be seen, mm -hmm. and needs to be taken to different audiences. Um, and the gallery is somewhat of a sacred space, kind of uh, very akin to a church. People go um, with an open mind to be receptive. Mm -hmm. um, and that allows them to be able to mingle and get to know the artist, get to know a little deeper and a richer mm -hmm. experience mm -hmm. with why things are being done. Um, and I've tried to erase my role or my understanding or my judgment of any issue, but just trying to bring it to light for mm -hmm. other people to, to experience and, and to make their own minds up. Okay, let's talk about, I wanna, let's talk about some of the early experiences also that shaped some of your views. This. You shared an experience, um, you talked about redlining back in the 1980s, uh, when insurance companies were discriminating against the gay community. Yeah. Um, can you talk about that a bit and how that, I know that, that was a big event in your life and how that led you to get involved in activism and, and taking up causes that are, you feel are important. Like how, how was that a yeah. key? I was, um, I was very young and I was part of a group of uh, young men uh, that really didn't socialize out in the real world. We basically, gay was not a household word as it is now. Yeah, back in uh, the 80s, it wasn't yeah. accepted, you know. Uh, and uh, so we hid, basically. We <laughs> had our clubs. We went in uh, after dark. Mm -hmm. We'd go in and we'd leave before dawn. Yeah. Uh, and we were out almost every night because we lived in a straight world under the pressures of not being yourself. Um, and we partied a lot, <laughs> you know, uh, one of the biggest, you, escape things, one of the biggest escape things is, is to, you know, party and, and it yeah. was the seventies and the eighties and it was very acceptable. And, you know, if somebody was missing, uh, you just figured that they were hung over. Okay. Um, but then they go missing two days. Yeah. Uh, and we knew each other very casually. It was, um, Fair weather friends kind of thing. Oh, mm -hmm. everything was um, not based in reality. 
you didn't want to <clears throat> make deep associations with people. Why is that? Like, the, because you were never able to socialize outside the bar anyway. Oh, okay, okay. You so know? you had limit. You had societal limitations that were. Yeah. So you yeah. know, all of a sudden the person just disappeared. Mm -hmm. The first one, and since we were partying a lot, you could figure, oh, they might have gone to rehab. Yeah. Right. And then we noticed that it started happening more and more, and we didn't know about AIDS. Mm -hmm. We didn't know about, and all of a sudden the word grid came around. And it was gay-related immune deficiency. Um, and so I, I think the insurance companies do like what they're doing now with COVID, redlining anything that's COVID, denying. Mm -hmm. um, but back then, as now, um, and it happens with almost every pandemic, the insurance companies would figure out if we deny the claim long enough, they will die. Mm -hmm. And it's a, wow. bus it's a business mm -hmm. model. Mm -hmm. um, and our friends were dying one after the other, one after the other, one after the other, and communities were de being devastated. And then we found out that they were doing what's called redlining mm -hmm. by, by zip codes, wherever there was a density of uh, a high risk people, they were automatically denying the claims. Mm, okay. Um, so things needed to be done and things yeah. got done to correct that. And we, um, well, let's, protested. We did let's a lot talk of about that, like, a, 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 what was the tri what was the tipping point for you? What, when did you say? Because before that point, you had not been involved in, in serious activism, right? No. So <laughs> not at all. Where was the? Obviously, there was something that moved you to the point, like, say, hey, this is bullshit. At some point, I've got to do something. Like, what was that tipping point for you? Like, uh, watching one patient feeding the other uh, a patient in the AIDS ward um, that was dying, getting out of his bed. Um, and picking up a tray from the hallway because the, the oh my god they would not they would bring in the food and roll them in, um, but they would have very little interaction with the mm. with the patient. Uh, they were all terminal anyway. Uh, Why was that? Do you think short staff just didn't no, they want fear, to be involved? Fear, fear of a, fear catching of AIDS, catching, AIDS, um, okay. catching grid. Grid. That's what they called that's, it back then. Yeah, because uh, back then at first it was thought to be a gay only. Right. Disease, mm -hmm. and uh, we tried to to explain that it wasn't the same thing. Um, that's why there's a lot of aversion, I think, to tracking uh, oh, because the, there was uh, going to be uh, contact tracing. Contact tracing also okay. back then, oh, yeah. and then there had been rumors that a lot of the Arizona uh, internment camps were being uh, re retrofitted for the AIDS. Those people. were just rumors, or turned um, out to be fact. It, 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 there was a, uh, a movement, an oh effort to do uh, oh. the computers, the AIDS uh, education money, and a lot of the yeah. research money was going towards supercomputers to keep track of everybody that was positive. Mm. Um, we were disposable mm. uh, and mm. we were dispensable. And as long as, and we knew that as long as it stayed um, geared towards us, um, we had no no. No future. So you witness this event and you're like, okay, something has to be done. Yeah. And, but at that point, there was, there was no really fully organized uh, activism yet. So no. how, did, how did, did that evolve? Like, it stemmed from Paris, New York, the, <clears throat> the urban areas where the, the larger amount of so people. So worldwide. Yeah, and people started acting out. Okay. Uh, and then... Um, Larry Kramer, uh, who was the founder of uh, the AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power, which is ACT UP, uh, started organizing uh, visuals, protests, marches to all happen at the same time okay. um, to, to make ink, to be, yeah. get in the news, to raise right. awareness so that everybody knew what was happening to us. And what was the central, like, what was the central message that you wanted to communicate? That like, it wasn't a gay disease and that it was going to affect the rest of the world and that we needed to act fast before um, it devastated the, the country. Okay. Right. You so, know. so eventually, obviously. The, and we needed medicine. And yeah. uh, medicines was, were available in Europe and in Mexico. Um, and pharmaceutical companies in, uh, in this country were, were falling behind and uh, not, we didn't have immediate access to, to the cost. Um, yeah. Cost prohibitive. Yeah. Um, so a lot of people were smuggling, basically drugs in, inside to keep each other alive. I see. Okay. So access to the, 
the drugs and so forth. And ironically, Fauci was at the center of... Uh, Fauci, yes, yeah, that's right. He, Fauci that's, was... That's how he made his name, arguing with uh, Larry, Kramer, Larry Kramer on the on TV. <laughs> that's right, way back when. I, I do recall seeing, seeing that. So um, I, this touches on a lot of things. I'm thinking, and we're going to jump into this topic of fear, because when I'm hearing you talk about this, I think a lot of times when something is new, um, societies and people, we're afraid of it. Yeah, because we don't understand it. And I think we're seeing a lot of similar dynamics play out with COVID and play out just, it's, it's interesting how how that fear motive um, really grips people. And like, we're gonna jump into that because in, in a little bit. You, said, you just said something interesting, <clears throat> yeah. this fear of not understanding. Yeah. Um, and I think it's half of that. <clears throat> and the other half is fear of understanding. Mm, okay. And not being ready to for the reality of what you understand. Got it. Um, because understanding a situation and feeling powerless over it, or being convinced that you are powerless over it, um, you run. Uh, yeah. And you try to medicate yourself either through alcohol or drugs. Mm. Um, and that's some what happened to me after this whole AIDS pandemic. Right. The big turning point in my life was. Um, I got to 32 and yeah. I outlived everybody that I knew pretty much. Mm -hmm. And at 32, I was diagnosed as terminal brain cancer. Yeah. And when I was told that I, that I had this diagnose, uh, the, the ecology and the, and the surgeon and everybody were there. And I was just sat there for a minute and I was like, this is perfect. And he goes, what do you mean it's perfect? I go like this, everybody dies of AIDS. I get to, I, I, I get a straight disease okay. and he's like a straight disease. So I was like, I don't know of a single gay man that's lived long enough to catch anything. Okay. And, he's, and he literally looked at me and goes, what are you stupid? <laughs> um, but it was the fear of not knowing because I, I already knew, yeah. I knew how to die of AIDS because I'd seen people dying of AIDS. I didn't did know what happen. cancer was. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's, you know, the reality of it is it's fear of knowing. <clears throat> so did you go through you know, like the grief cycle process of, you know, denial, the bargaining, all those. Now, things. when I got my diagnosis, yeah. I, I, um, I was pretty satisfied that, that I had outlived everybody that I had more experiences than everybody that I knew. Um, so you're feeling lived, like I've lived a full life at 32. I've lived that full life at 32 because wow. those were my points of reference. Most yeah. people didn't last that long. Oh my God. Um, so I wow. accepted my situation really well. What I, the biggest challenge in my life was waking up from the surgery. Hmm. And I was alive. So hold up, back up. You had surgery. Yeah, I had a weight craniotomy uh, at 32. What is that? They cut your head open. <laughs> um, and like they, a like a lid coming do, off. Do, you know, you know, it's funny because I, I was like, okay, so I have a tumor this big. Where's my brain? And he's like, he, he was the surgeon was a young guy, and he's like, what are you really stupid? He goes, that's a sponge tissue. It's just compressing your brain. And I was like. Oh, I go, you realize I don't know how to spell biology. <laughs> I, know, I know how to spell. So you had a tumor the size of a fist? Yeah. Oh uh, and so they, um, <clears throat> I survived. Yeah. Um, and Obviously. there was, I think, four or five of us that, that were anomalies that had this type of cancer. And they hooked us all up to talk. <laughs> One of them didn't make it out of the surgery, but he was really old. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he wasn't expected to. And then little by slowly, the, you know, the peer support group, you yeah. know, it's like cancer support group. They all died. <laughs> you know, I was like, and I was just, I, I didn't know, standing. I didn't know, I didn't know how to handle that. Yeah. Um, yeah. I didn't know how to live with cancer. I had to learn how to use my hands again, how to cope. I had no coping skills. I had a good denial system. Mm -hmm. I had alcohol and I had drugs. Yeah, so um, self-medicated. And they right. basically saved my life through the AIDS pandemic. Mm. And they all but shredded my life through cancer. Afterwards, yeah. Um, because I, I had no, I had n nothing. Uh, I did not know how to deal with uh, um, yeah. that. 
So yeah, that's a that's that makes sense a lot of sense. So I want I want to jump back in time a little bit because you you have a, a quote here that I I thought was I, I picked a lot of your quotes. <laughs> You've been through all my social media, I all my history. I've been stalking you. I've been stalking you a little bit, just just a little bit. But you said I grew up without being able to say who I was, without being able to express who I am, out of fear, yeah. without a fear of getting hurt. And right. you know, you tell the story of. You knew by the time you were 13 that you were gay, yeah. but you grew up in a in a very, what I understand, a very traditional heteronormative. Heteronormative. Hetero, <laughs> that's a new term. Heteronormative. Okay, so you had um, a, an environment where you couldn't talk about how you felt. So how did that like in layman's terms? Fag bashing and murder uh, was the thing that they did to gay people. It really? was called fag bashing for shits and giggles. People would yeah. just go around, pick a gay person, beat the hell out of them, yeah. and they would kill them. So <laughs> you you couldn't talk to your family. You couldn't talk. You you, no. you had close friends within the gay community that you could talk to. But yeah, obviously. But yeah, that was it. And I left. Uh, I left home early, yeah. and my adult skills were were given to me. Uh, based on, on street smarts um, because my adopted mothers would became drag queens and my adopted fathers were bar owners and bartenders um, because I had no street smarts. So uh, that's where like that's where a lot of um, back then a lot of uh, folks that knew they were gay they had to turn to families within the community that you right. create because yeah, you create you, you adopt families. Family. Yeah. So most so when did when were you able to actually talk to your actual biological family about all this or did that never happen that happened at 32 um, oh my gosh that yeah they, like they kind of they knew that i was gay but we had become very <laughs> distant um yeah. which separated and i'd gone my way as yeah. uh, okay and i ran around the country i just uh yeah. spoke to somebody about that they go like this what brought you to this state and i was like you know just i heard that somebody was gay there and i and they yeah. You know, I ended up in Saugatuck, Michigan, in San Francisco, Manhattan, where the gay enclaves were for uh, to feel uh, safe. Mm -hmm. What do you? I'm just curious about your just opinion overall, just on labels in general. It's an interesting thing. Like in our society, we've got labels for everything. everything. Like um, sexual preference. Now you've got sapiosexuals. You've got like demisexual. I don't even know what all this shit means. And there's like I'll be on Tinder, you know, looking through it and, and people ha have all these labels for themselves. And I'm like, and I'm sitting here thinking I'm just a fucking human. Like I don't, I'm, I'm a human. I have certain preferences, but um, do you think that, I, cause I kind of get the feeling that like we, we always try to label and box each other. You know, you meet somebody mm -hmm. and you're like, okay, what, what box, what category did yeah. I put you in? Okay. You're a gay man. You're an artist. You're, and I'm sitting uh, here trying to categorize you. Like, I think we miss a lot of, connection yeah, when you do yeah. that what do you I, think? right like, now there's the okay so what what do i go by am, am i gay am i am i cisgender am i and people always ask me to go oh so do you want to be called latinx now or or are you okay with latino or shall i call you hispanic and then i joke i go like this oh honey don't worry about it you could call me spick i grew up with that word <laughs> and and it doesn't tag me anymore because what, how you label me is none of my business and and they get all offended you know and i was like okay i'm just teasing uh you could call me hispanic you could label, you could refer to me as hispanic but remember, I could be his panic, your panic, her panic, everybody's <laughs> panic in this world. <laughs> and I have a track record. <laughs> yeah. um, it's a matter of how you, um, how you look at it. If it bothers you, ask yourself, why is it bothering you? But do you think that we judge each other too much? Like we're, we're, we're putting so many, it's, it's almost like I, I see people want to put each other in boxes so then they can feel good about how you know, like they have certain judgments or way, we all have ways that we view life. And like, if I can put you in certain categories and boxes, mm -hmm. I can feel good about like, just, you know, I don't really have to accept yeah. you fully. I can, I can like limit yeah. our connection. At least that's what it feels like to me. Like yeah. a lot of this is just to keep people almost yeah. at bay and like, 
you know, I've yeah. got my space, you've got your yeah. space. Well, according you know. to the government, I'm a non, non, non-white Hispanic. <laughs> yeah. That's the, the block that they gave me. That, and I don't know what that means. That's non-white kind of, Hispanic. Non-white Hispanic. And, and I was like, I wonder if, if I'm a non-black Hispanic <laughs> also. You know, I, I have no idea. Yeah. Their um, yeah. labels are created to facilitate certain studies and stuff like that. Yeah. Hispanic was created yeah. um, during the Nixon administration. Uh, as, and now they talk about Hispanic voting bloc, and it's like Hispanic is like 30, 33 countries yeah. with their own class, dynamic, ethnic makeup. Got very conservative so Hispanics, it's, very it's not a, It's definitely not a voting bloc, and it's yeah. definitely not a country. I keep telling you, Hispanic is not a country. Um, um, so I, I think we um, people are allowed to self-identify yeah. however they want. Okay. Um, but when we start imposing politically correct terms on people, it masks it. And for years, we went along thinking that everything was fine in this country and that discrimination, racism, and all these terms had gone in the past and they were a thing of yesterday. Um, and lo and behold, we realized that once people are allowed not to be politically correct, like we've seen the last four years, yeah. Um, because Trump did not start this. Everybody go, oh my God, Trump, Trump is stirring up the racism and discrimination. And I'm like, he did not. He yeah. gave permission to not use politically correct terms. Mm-hmm. The, the, this divisiveness exists. Mm-hmm. We need to learn to live with it and to inspire it, and it to change. But unless we could acknowledge it, we can't name it. Uh, we can't change it. Um, so it is what it is. Don't put a moral implication on it. Don't judge it as good, bad, or right, or wrong. This is what's here. There is divisiveness. There is this. What are we doing with it? Yeah. Let's move forward. Um, you may have some perceptions of, and interpretations of who I am. Um, and I may not agree with it. Now, mine is to show you who I am. Mm. For you to, to get a different experience. Um, but if I challenge you and I say, Jason World, you're wrong. <laughs> Jason World's going to go like this. <laughs> no, I'm not. Oh, because people don't like to be told. No, I'm wrong. not. And you're yeah. going to defend yeah. yourself. And I lost, I lost any opportunity to, to inspire change in this yeah. world with yeah. you. <laughs> that, that reminds me of an experience I had. I, I love uh, calling you Jason World. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's cool. I had um, an experience where I went to... Uh, I have press credentials and I, I wanted to go interview both sides at the Trump rally. Uh-huh. And I said, but I didn't want to take sides. So I wore my Mr. Rogers shirt, uh-huh. Fred Rogers, that says good vibes. So who, who can be upset at that? And I would just ask people from both sides. I would, I would just ask them what they liked or what they didn't like about the candidate or the uh-huh. president. And, and then I would just, they're expecting me to react and they're expecting me to re- yeah. react to what they say. But my, mm-hmm. my response was always like, you know what, that's, that's really interesting. I've never actually considered it from that point of view. I'm gonna have to think about that. And like actually, and truly like listening to what they say and just accepting it and listening to it. People have valid reasons <laughs> for, for everything. Oh, well, um, everything in your mind that you think you, you justify, right? We all do. Right? Yeah. And, so. and the thing is, once you're raised a certain way, yeah. it's a belief system that you have. And even if um, two-thirds of it is true, one-third of it is not, um, you're, going to, you're going to believe the whole thing. Because to, to discount part of it um, means to discount... The other two thirds or, or three quarters of your system mm-hmm. of, of how you live, um, and change is the most difficult for, thing for people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so they're going to find a way to to stay as close to th- their reality. And I always give the example of some: you have the atheist, the agnostic, and the believer. A believer, you're not going to shake his belief system. Mm-hmm. that he believes in God, no matter how much you try, um, they're not going to. Mm-hmm. The agnostic really doesn't care. Um, he doesn't believe that it's proof or doesn't really care, doesn't know if it's true or not. And quite honestly, he gave up or she gave up on the 
discussion. The atheist becomes the really uh, interesting person because they're researching. They're, they're not discounting the existence of God or the existence of God. They're just saying that there's no proof and they keep looking for proof. So they're like the best debaters. Mm -hmm. um, and while if you look at it that way and you approach people, you'll, you'll realize that some people are unshakable um, their belief system because it's it's born with them. Mm -hmm. They've been raised that way. They've been insulated. Their identity that, is yeah, tied up, tied up, up too. Yeah. So to tell them that sure. one thing is wrong, everything is wrong mm -hmm. about them. Yeah. Um, and all you could do is maybe get close to them and let them know how you live. Yeah. That's good. I've got some really fun questions that we're going to dive into. Now. <laughs> okay. This is really going to be fun. Like I'm, I'm taking some time to do this. It's going to yeah? be good. Okay. Listen, so I want to, I want to like dive into some stuff so we can, uh -huh. so I, I, we can really get to know Rolando. Who uh -oh. Rolando is. So, um, who, let's talk about and who has been your inspiration and role models in your life? Like maybe the one or two biggest inspiration and what did you learn from them? Uh, my biggest inspiration and she's still alive is my junior college art professor. Wow. Marilyn Gallup Roberts. Okay. Um, I used to think she was the silliest woman in the world because uh, I was all about competition, all about being good and all this stuff. And she was like, that is beautiful. That is perfect. Oh my God. And she was always so thrilled with everything, you know? And I was like, no, this looks really bad. <laughs> and she's like, oh no, it has so much emotion. <laughs> and she was life's cheerleader. Mm -hmm. um, and with that personality, with that take on life, um, she rearranged how I drew, how I painted. Um, you mean it, and she because I went in, yeah, I went in okay. really graphic, real tight, okay. real thing. And she's like, "You know how to do that so well. Let's try something else." Okay. <laughs> and I would like try doing something else, and I wasn't happy. But I want to go back to the way I drew. Uh, but she would always be like. She was very accepting of where you were. Yeah, and celebratory. And helping you and, grow. Um, <laughs> Same time. And, and she, she taught me okay. not, not to be too serious. Okay. Um, not to be so... Not to take yourself too serious. Too serious, to take, or to take other people so serious. Interesting. Yeah. Um, that it was a learning process, that everything I touched didn't have to be a finished product. And how has that helped your life? Exercise. How has that served you to, to learn that lesson? Um... I get to look and, 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 I, and I see artists now mm -hmm. um, and I recognize their potential and I see where their attitudes are coming from, whether it's um, but they're seeking money, um, they're seeking social change, um, they're seeking um, a venue or looking for a medium to express themselves uh, where they can't do it orally or in the written word um, and I can work with that. Um, and I get to create the enthusiasm um, to stop any conversations that they may have um, that may cause them to quit. Mm -hmm. uh, because I want everybody to have a voice. And through the years, what I've learned is that people have a variety of different learning modalities. Um, and they're going to express themselves, once again, going back to Chapman, mm -hmm. um, yeah. based on the language that they they speak. Yeah. Uh, maybe their language is ceramic. Mm -hmm. Maybe their language is metal. Uh, maybe it's oil paint. Um, maybe it's performance. Uh, and, you know, so how do you nurture that? How do you in, inspire someone when they think that they've reached a plateau and they're going to quit mm -hmm. and just give them the enthusiasm a little bit more? Um, in Marilyn Gottlieb Roberts is okay. one of the, how I said she was the, the life's cheerleader. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Is there someone else that's been, that you would think of that would be uh, in that same category? Uh, every, you know, um, I know you've had a lot of, there's so many there it's, it, we're going on almost 60 years. Yeah. Um, it's hard, and, hard to choose. It, and there's so many people, uh, writers, uh, was there ever been something that's like, 
if you can think about something that somebody said to you at a key moment in life that yes. absolutely changed everything. What yes. was it? Nelly Cruz told me, you have so much and so much money, so much life, and you're sitting here putting needles in your arm and feeling sorry for yourself. And that comment hurt because mm. I never saw myself as somebody who felt sorry for myself. Mm. And that was when I stopped using. Uh, that's what that's what turned my life into, uh, brought me into recovery. Because mm. um, I hated needy people. I still mm. hate needy people. <laughs> I, I, it's okay to, um, to need, mm. but to be needy, um, uh, to take, 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 others. take, and, yeah. and <clears throat> I didn't realize that I had been throwing a massive lifelong pity party. Oh, I've been there. Yeah. And <laughs> you know, and yeah, that's like <laughs> I, since since I uh, then I uh, yeah. I've adopted a, a, my favorite line towards uh, <clears throat> many of the other people that I deal with, and I'm like, okay, you have 15 minutes to feel as sorry for yourself as you want, throw things, smash things with the 15 minute cutoff, you get to work on the solution. Yeah. Um, so I, I think that one of the keys that I kind of like to is like acknowledge the problem, but spend is, spend your energy on solutions, right. not on not focusing on problem, which yeah. we, we tend to get stuck sometimes. Yeah. Doing well, that's, I, I started a nonprofit, I co-founded a nonprofit with a friend of mine, Craig McInnes, uh, called Arts Energy. Yeah. And we were going to hold our first meeting and we were like, okay, everybody's going to complain about everything, you know, because we wanted to get into the art fairs. We want yeah. to organize all the different districts in Palm Beach County. Mm -hmm. And we're like, how are we going to uh, frame this? Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, solutions only. You can only <laughs> yeah. mention, I always you do can this only mention the, the problem exactly. after you, you say, this is the yeah. solution to this. <laughs> Whenever somebody brings me a problem, I am say I educate them. I say, this is great that you're bringing me a problem, but don't bring me a problem unless you're also going to propose a fucking solution. solution yeah. no, don't just bring me problems. Yeah. I got enough that I'm, I'm, I'm yeah. good on those. So. And, and we did. We actually, um, then that has been, I think, a, a formula that, yeah. that works. It works. Um, yeah. Because I think we all know what the problems are. Yeah. And until, yeah, we don't need to keep hearing about this. We and know. your solution yeah. may not be my solution, mm -hmm. but I may take a bit of your solution and try it. Yeah, or and it might be. I mean, you, you might know. you might hear a solution from yeah. somebody that's, you know, often unexpected. Yeah, oftentimes unexpected. the answers in our life come from other people, and mm -hmm. you know, um, I've, I've learned. You know, I've recently been traveling with yeah. Kenny a lot, and like mm -hmm. I've learned there's problems that I've had that I haven't even, I would never even think of the solution that I saw yeah. him have. I was like, I would never, that never would have even entered well, that into comes, space. That comes back from people have different interpretations. Yeah. And um, I, yeah. I, I talked to you about- Different the, life experiences. I talked to you about my big exercise the, about the study of a cube. Yeah. You know, if you look at the cube at- At, right. uh, at, at any angle. At, you know, at yeah. uh, eye level. Okay. You see the front. If I move it here, you see two sides. If I move it this way, you see another two sides. If I hold it up, you see two sides. If I hold it here, you th see three sides. Mm -hmm. but the cube has six sides. Yeah. So in life, you, you don't know which three sides you're looking at and which three sides somebody else is looking at. Right. Different perspective right. that they can see. Yeah. And it's about perspective, life perspectives and perceptions. Yeah. And when um, you're dealing with a group, and <clears throat> I think human beings are meant to, to be pack animals, social mm -hmm. animals. Social, yeah, definitely. And I think it's that discussion um, of what appears to be there, yeah. what's really there, and what I think I'm seeing, and what my mind fills in. Yeah. Um, and it's interesting for me to have a conversation with you and see where you where your mind fills in certain aspects. Sure, you sure. Know? Um, what this is not a fair question. I'm just gonna okay. It, but well, my favorite book. <laughs> no, actually, I do want to ask you that. Let's jump there. I want to know what is the number one book that that's changed your life, and what's the top book that you usually recommend or give as a gift 
Um, this is an easy question, by the way. I, have I, a I, I tend to get Bibles and AA textbooks these days. Oh, interesting. Um, okay. Because I think AA, uh, the AA textbook is great outline, uh, and the Bible is still a really good inspirational book. <laughs> and I try to explain to people, don't, don't read these things like dogmas, and don't read it as, oh my God, I'm an addict, or I'm an alcoholic. Or I'm a bad person. Or I'm a bad person. Yeah. But just look, um, and look at the synchronicities. The I Ching is um, uh, also another book because it has a practical exercise. You get to throw coins and stuff like that. Um, and it ties the AA book and the Bible to old Asian uh, philosophies. Yeah. Um, and I read a lot of theology books and a lot of self-help books over the years. And what I try to do is, is bring everybody to the same table telling them look at what's mm-hmm. what they share in common mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know um what are, what are they all trying to get at um and it's trying to find joy peace love harmony um so which book has had if you had to pick one book that's had the biggest impact on you which book the importance of being earnest <laughs> uh, the importance of being earnest okay <laughs> <laughs> yes, Oscar Wilde. I love Oscar Wilde. Okay, why why that book? Because he's the most sarcastic queen I know, <laughs> <laughs> and highly critical of uh, nuances uh, of society and highbrow society. Okay, and he wrote for them, uh, and he wrote about them, and critical of them, mm. uh, and the bourgeois uh, thing. And he did a lot of time in, in jail because of it. Uh, <laughs> uh, but he has one quote that says um, that about daring to look beneath the surface and that you, you look beneath the surface at your peril. Mm. Um, because society, we like to, to interpret what's up here. Mm-hmm. And we like to argue and fix what's up here. But we don't like to dig too deep at the root it's causes funny, of like, things. I like uh, one of my favorite quotes is by Stephen Covey. He says, "You know, for every thousand people that are hacking that believes, there's one person working on the root." Right. Mm-hmm. You know, we we tend to, right. in fact, look at all our medications in this pharmaceutical industries are almost always treating symptoms and, and rarely not the root cause. Not the really root cause. cause. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So we uh, just mentioned <clears throat> that to somebody. Um, this week, um, I, uh, there's 10, uh, 10 people seeing a doctor in one hour, paying for the doctors one hour, and then they have uh, somebody come in and guesstimate what, based on your symptoms, what they're going to treat you with. But they haven't done blood work, they haven't done x-rays, they haven't done anything because we can't afford, because the medical system here doesn't afford us that luxury. Yeah. So you're being you're being treated based on the symptoms, and mm-hmm. you really don't know what the yeah. cause of it yeah. really yeah. is. Uh, yeah. It's just an educated guess. Um, this is the hard question that I was going to ask you, and I, and I apologize ahead of time, but it's like if you if you had to pick what, in your opinion, like. What is the key to finding happiness in life? So many people, especially now with COVID going on, so many people are dealing with, um, you know, just struggling with isolation, depression. Um, maybe their life's been, maybe their career they have, their life's been kind of turned upside down. A lot of people are, are dealing with these things, especially right now. Um, I mean, what do you think? What do you think the key has been for you, with all you've been through, to find happiness, to find that joy and that we all want? Every every human being longs for peace and happiness and joy, but it seems so yeah. elusive for so many people. What do you, what's been the key for you to? Being vulnerable. Okay. Um, <clears throat> if I'm not vulnerable and I don't tell you I'm hurting, um, you won't offer help. Mm. If I don't get vulnerable and tell you that, um, that this really makes me happy, you don't get the opportunity to celebrate with me. Um, if I walk around, which I did for years, I got this, um, this doesn't affect me. This doesn't touch me Mm -hmm. and I compartmentalize everything. Um, false humility. Mm -hmm. Oh, you won this award. Oh, it's nothing. Mm -hmm. Um, so I never felt celebrated. I never felt comforted. 
I never felt listened to, mm -hmm. but I wasn't talking. Mm -hmm. I wasn't saying I was happy. Yeah. I wasn't telling you I was sad. Yeah. And well, think I, about like I, I was denying. I well, was denying humanity to be human with me, and then I would walk around saying that I live in an inhuman world. Mm -hmm. Well, it's uh, kind. Of, I mean, if you look at kind of what you went through early on, and I think a lot of stuff that we yeah. deal with goes back to our childhood. Like, you had to hide and mask yeah. so much of who you were, so much of your feelings for so long mm -hmm. that that probably became a habit right. to you, you know, and affected you. So yeah. learning to be vulnerable, vulnerable, but also I, I'm hearing what you're saying is to communicate that. To communicate the vulnerability. To yeah. others. Okay. Yeah. Um, I don't, not everybody, I don't know if you know who Yuri Jeller is, the mind reader <laughs> that used to bend spoons. Not everybody has that gift. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, very few people have that gift. Um, and unless you communicate with them and express what makes you happy. Oh, okay. Give people the opportunity to create the world yeah. um, that you want to live in. Yeah. Give people permission to be kind. Um, people want to be kind. Mm -hmm. um, but I wouldn't let them be kind to me. I definitely, I, yeah. I can resonate. I definitely struggled with the same thing. Mm -hmm. And I used to think that it was strength to, you know, hey, I can... I can, white I can knuckle it. I, I call handle, it white knuckle. Yeah, yeah I just can handle like, this. I, I can, can do this. I got this. Did you know? Yeah. And then I, I've actually learned over time that it actually takes a lot more strength to ask for help. Mm -hmm. yeah. The the ability to, and the willingness to ask for help and be vulnerable, like you were saying, is takes a lot more strength mm -hmm. than it does just to say, no, I got this. I'm going to keep this stuff in. But I've definitely struggled with the same thing in my life, and and it has not served me well when yeah. I've when I've decided to. You know, just oh, I got this, yeah. and I'm and I'm still working on it. I'm yeah. still a work in progress. I'm still like you know working on that process. So I I walk around scared ninety nine percent of the time. <laughs> and I, you know, we all have fear, the, the, don't we? Yeah, like, and we it's all... normal. <clears throat> yeah, the, the thing is, if you start denying one feeling. Yeah, you deny another feeling. Mm -hmm. You deny another feeling, mm -hmm. and then for years I was running on rage and apathy. Yeah, um, and you know and. You you can only go so far with those extreme emotions um, before you forget what everything else is. Mm. Uh, and I remember going to the beach. Um, I had been in prison for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. uh, and in prison, you have to be very uh, cold, mm -hmm. non-expressive, non-emotive. Right. Um, as part of a routine. Yeah, we've that, talked about this. I've also spent time yeah. in prison, too. So yeah. we... we understand and, that area we, yeah. in that space you have to suppress yeah and being being gay most of my life uh, <clears throat> socially um, I didn't have too much access to children you know because we were all adults um, now children because of marriage equality and adoption and stuff is normal uh, there's more kids in the community but I didn't have access to kids and then I had just come out of prison and I'm walking on the beach and this ball comes rolling and hits me on the foot and sits there. And I look at the ball and I look up and there's a little kid there. I froze. I didn't know what to do. <laughs> it was like, it was like one of these, like, what is this healing? It's was, it was like, what, is, what do I do? You know, so I, I tapped the ball uh, with my foot and lo and behold, the, the kid kicks it back at me and I'm like, Okay, so I'll kick it back at him. And, oh my and I, I think I went from apathy to rage to joy, <laughs> you know, and I didn't, and, I, and, and it was that slow yeah. to <laughs> regain um, emotions because there had been so much death, so much disgust, yeah, sure. so much negativity that I had decided to block it out. And I was happy that I got to experience joy was my first feeling that came back. That is wonderful. Because I'm not going to give it up anymore. <laughs> back, back to this fun list. This is, this is actually a question. We talk about fear. Like one of the biggest fears people have is the fear of failure. Like I'm going to try something. I'm going to fail. We've all done that. Um, we've tried something that didn't work out. And, and um, so what has been, if you're open to talking about this, what has been your biggest failure? But most importantly, what did you learn from it? And, and maybe how has failure, how has an apparent failure set you up for later success? 
something that initially you would say, oh, this was a big failure, but now you look back and say, you know, that actually set me up for amazing thing. Um, my biggest failure in life was um, deciding never to get emotionally attached to someone. Um, I saw I, I couldn't handle the loss of being in love with people uh, in four you different. Mean people would leave, come into your life and leave. Time people would come, come into my life and die. <sighs> yeah, since very early. Sure. And I decided that I was going to be okay alone. Yeah, to protect yourself. To it's protect better just myself. not to get close. So I decided to block sure. off the, that kind of emotional uh, attachment. Uh, and eventually I, f I found no, n no worth in frivolous sexual contacts. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've been celibate pretty much for most of, most of my life. And recently uh, I'm pushing 60 and I realized that I have a lot that I've never shared with anybody. I, um, um, you know, and, I, and I'd love to get old with somebody. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's probably my biggest regret mm -hmm. um, is that I've been comfortable alone for so long mm -hmm. and I have no family, no children, no, no spouse. Um, and I'm, and I may be ready to be in a relationship now, mm. but I, you know, in the back of my mind, the fear says you may be too old for that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I'm making an effort. Coming back so, on the market. I'm making it. <laughs> you know, to, you know, and, um, ah, I'm, 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 you know, somewhat jaded, somewhat, <laughs> you know, set my ways. Um, and I don't, I, I have to get rid of all those conversations and just go and have dinners, get to know yeah. other, uh, other people, uh, with the intention to manifest a relationship, yeah. Yeah. not well, with the exciting. intention to manifest yes. the boundary. Because whatever we yeah. focus on grows, and like, yeah, yeah, we focus on our fears, they, they grow. So um, do, is there an example of a, a failure you had in your life that like you look back and, and it led to a success? Well, yeah, I, um, I, I didn't go to college. Mm -hmm. uh, because I had a career as a, as a model when I was a kid and I was doing window displays and uh, mm -hmm. I was working in, in the shishi pupu kaka, uh, <laughs> what I call it. It's a know, fun space. High, high fashion, haute couture world. Yeah, that's I, fun. I ended up in Beverly Hills living in Laurel Canyon. Uh, I was young. Uh, and all of a sudden I, I, I realized I am 19 years old. Yeah. I have absolutely no conversation with any of these people. They're all highly educated. They're all wealthy. Okay. Uh, they're all groomed. And I'm an inner city kid with a lot of talent, but absolutely no academic. So you made a decision at that I point? quit. I okay. went back to school. Oh, and okay. wow. I went to junior college. I went to... Get this my is how you point. ended up in our school eventually. Yeah, right? I, went, I couldn't afford the schools. I was... Um, <clears throat> I aimed high. I wanted to go to the best art schools and I didn't have the money. Yeah. So I knew I needed the grade point average and the scholarships. Got it. So I went back to junior college, left Beverly Hills, went back to the small wow. town. That was a that was a tough choice at that yeah. age. I mean, that yeah. was actually a pretty mature choice for yeah. 19 years old. That's... So and I did. I went, I got wow. my uh scholarships and yeah. I got my life together and I got accepted in all three universities. I went to one and I was like, I look like nothing like these people. They were all in khaki pants and white shirts and they're all crispy white people. <laughs> I'm not going to say which university that was really, it's an Ivy league school. That, that sounds like where I went. BYU and I was like, I don't belong here. <laughs> the other one I was like, it was like a completely commercial uh, <laughs> school. And I was like, this is so dry, so boring. Yeah. And then I, I walked into the School of the Art Institute in Chicago. And they had messy looking people, <laughs> messy studios and electronics. Okay, listen, I got I to gotta ask you this. And how I was did, like, I'm home. <laughs> how did you decide, like, how did you decide on art? Did you already know that you had an artistic bent or? 
My father oh. wanted me to be a, a draftsman, uh, an engineer. Oh my gosh, I cannot imagine. I had, been, I had <laughs> been painting. I had been painting since I was a little kid. My mom yeah. would take me to a little old guy in the neighborhood in Elizabeth, New Jersey, that would teach me to paint. And I love. I painting. think you would die if you had to draft yeah. all day. And yeah, I, think I know, that right? would kill you. <laughs> like, and sitting over a drafting table and that was that was smashed yeah um the drawing and the painting uh was kind of smashed uh because i was good at math mm -hmm. i was good at geometry and then my father saw that and yeah, he was yeah, like, yeah oh my god we, we have an engineer that. we got an engineer <laughs> and like most parents they want most most immigrant parents want the best for their kids right they want them to, they want them to excel right excel further than they yeah. did like, and, and you know and yeah. he 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 wanted the best for me yeah, you know? and i was good. just like i can't draw another straight line if you paid me and, you know and i tried I and, I, and i really line. tried you know um, okay i well, i, I got to ask you that's a great that's a great segue listen if you if you had to like up to this point in your life and you've had so many experiences what looking back um or even maybe looking forward, but what achievement are you most proud of? Like, what is the thing that you accomplished that you are most proud of to this point? Uh, I would want to say the Muse Award uh, that I just received uh, for cultural leadership, um, which I think most people would say. Um, I would, um, I would say being on stage, um, Compass Community Center is a, um, a LGBT community center. And it hooked me up with a young gay man, a uh, person. Mm -hmm. And we had a conversation exchanging histories, uh, passing on what I knew of the gay world to, to expose the, the youngster. And it's called the Legacy Project. Okay. And a number of us, uh, seven of us, older people, were called, le le you know, with legacies only because we, we aged. <laughs> uh, but we got to speak to the youth. Yeah. And they got to tell our stories on stage yeah. at a theater. Um, and that was probably the most meaningful and most impactful thing. Because um, how I said, I, I had decided that it wasn't about the money, it wasn't about the exhibition, it was about leaving a legacy behind. And lo and behold, two years ago, mm -hmm. they had asked me to play the role of person offering a legacy to a younger person. Mm -hmm. um, and that was probably the most fulfilling thing so far in my life. Do you think that that's something that at some point we all need to do is to find ways to pay it forward and give back? And you know, do you think that everybody has something to contribute? And, yes, you know, to I do. I, I do. I think um, I, want, I want to ask you about your um, how success when you when you think about success, everybody has different definitions of success. What is your current definition of success and how has that changed over the years? Because I know it's changed dramatically for you over over time. The last 10 years has pretty much been consistent. I organize huge exhibitions, uh, outdoor events, music concerts, and everything. And I have one rule of thumb. Don't worry who's going to show up. Create it for one person to make a difference in one person's life. Mm -hmm. Everything else is cream. And I hold the event. I look around. I see a lot of people happy and a lot of people enjoying themselves. And I feel satisfied, but I really beam and I really hit the ceiling when someone comes and tells me this was the best day of my life. You know, um, and I may not know the person, um, but just to know that I made an impact um, and it doesn't have to be the artist who, who's showing, the artist who sold the piece, it doesn't have to be, um, it, it could just be a person that came in and really liked the vendor, the ice cream mm -hmm. vendor, <laughs> you know, and said, Oh my God, I'm having such a great time. Thank yeah. you for putting this together. Um, it made a difference to me today where I needed this yeah. today. Yeah. Um, and I think that if I could go home and put my head <laughs> on the pillow and say, I helped inspire or change one person today. Mm -hmm. 
So that's it's your biggest current definition of success is today I've helped one inspire person. and motivate at least one person. Right. And that's a challenge because you can't do that every day. Uh, and it gives you a reason to wake up. Well, I mean, what, uh, what do you think are the ways, when you think about inspiring and motivating others, do you think a lot of it is mostly how you conduct yourself? You're letting your own light shine for yeah. lack of a better, so people can see. Everybody's watching you even when you're by yourself. Yeah. I learned that lesson a long time ago that actually people are always watching you. Yeah. Like, and you're on the phone. Have you ever heard that smile when yeah. you answer the phone? Because people could sense mm -hmm. no matter where you're at, your yeah. energy is very yeah. conducive. Um, Everything is energy, isn't yeah. it? Like, mm -hmm. and the energy we give off and... Yeah, that's gosh. We could we could <laughs> oh my gosh, we could talk about this. That's a rabbit hole because we could go there yes. for hours. Rich man, poor man. <laughs> the, 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 um, okay, so tell me, Eckhart Tolle. Let's, let's get oh in, let's get God. into it. Let's, I was supposed to be in Hawaii with uh, him, interviewing him. Actually, this uh, this year, I was I was scheduled and invited to go and interview uh, him, and then COVID. <laughs> <sighs> anyway, then we'll have the opportunity again in the future. Um, yeah. I think we've already touched on this, but. And I think we're going to talk about S eventually. S gratitude landmark. <laughs> about, about what? About landmark training, gratitude training. S. Oh, God, there's so much. We, there's so much. I, in 50 years, I've done all of them. You know, so I and, we can only scratch the surface because there's we can go down these rabbit holes for a long time. But okay, tell me, um, tell me about a time where you realized that you 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 needed to to make a change in your life, like. How did that come about and what did you do? Like where you realized, I, and I, I can think of a, a few, but if you have one that stands out when you realized, okay, I've got to make a change in my life. How did that come about and what did you do? The, the, the <clears throat> biggest change that I made in my life was to decide to go back to school. Uh, and the second of, uh, was when I was given, uh, when I graduated, I was given the Ryerson Traveling Fellowship. And... Of all places, I decided to go to Cuba. Mm. And I was supposed to write a report and they go like this, you don't need to because we didn't have relationships with Cuba. Uh, but I wanted to go to Cuba. Um, and it was uh, money that was given to me as a grant so, mm. uh, upon graduation. And I did. Yeah. And it made the world of a difference to me because I was born in this country, mm -hmm. but my whole family was from Cuba. And I got to see the houses that they were raised in. It made my family history real. Did you feel you felt more connected to your own heritage and so forth? Or did it seem kind of... Have, like you, this, ever, have, you, have you ever walked into a foreign country and, and, and felt really American? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> that's how I felt. That's how I, I, that's how I felt my whole life in this country. Okay. You felt out of place here your yes. whole life. Yeah. And people, okay. as I grew up with, go back to your country. And I was like, I was born here. <laughs> yeah. um, and the day I landed in Cuba, I knew that I belonged there. Interesting. Even though I was born here, they spoke like me. They looked like me. They yeah. ate foods like me. Um, and, it, and, it, and I didn't feel like an outsider anymore. Okay. And even when I came back, I no longer felt like an outsider because I knew where I came from. I was going to guess that, well... You talked about the the person who had snapped you out of your drug addiction. Uh -huh. That was and another one. That, that 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 had to be a massive shift in your life at that point. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. You know that conversation and then how how you were able to break out of yeah. the, the addiction, too. Yeah. Um, and she was an employee, by the way. Oh uh, yeah. So she was taking a big risk. Yeah. Uh -huh. To be that honest with you. Yeah. Because you could have told her, "Take a hike. You're yeah. out of here." <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay. Um, okay. This is a good question. What is, what is one of the best or most worthwhile investments you've ever made? It could be an investment of money or time or energy. What's the, this is, I know you can pick a lot of things because oh, you have God. a lot of experiences, but when you think about this, what comes to mind at first? The biggest investment is my life was to rekindle uh, my relationship with my family. Your biological family. Yeah. So this was yeah. somewhere in your 30s or way forward later? later uh, it's 
broke ground in my 30s, but uh -huh, it didn't yeah. really happen until uh, my 50s. Wow. Okay. Uh, uh, okay. Yeah, so in the last 10 years, uh, um, they, are you thinking like, of your parents when I think? My parents, my sister, my brother, okay. their children. Um, they never had an opportunity to get to know me, and I never had the opportunity to get to know them because um, mm -hmm. I was ripping and running, doing prison sentences, trying to build a career, trying to have my own life, um, mm -hmm. moving from gay enclave to gay enclave, doing uh, circuit parties, <laughs> going to sleep in, yeah. in Georgia, waking up in, in were they trying to reach out to you during this period, or were you? They didn't just know. Not they didn't know me. They, they. I was pretty much estranged from them. Yeah. Um, and you were you trying to? You weren't trying to reach out either. You I were just was, like, I had. Yeah. I have my own life. I'm doing my own thing. Right. I've got essentially my own family because you developed that network right. early on, right? Yeah. But knowing them, <clears throat> uh, knowing, identifying their names, knowing their birthdays, knowing their favorite ice creams. Yeah. Uh, was it really fun getting really with your, fun. you have nieces and nephews, right? Yeah. So like getting reconnected with them had to be uh, a lot of fun. Yeah. Mm -hmm. like, very fulfilling. And, and it's still a work in progress. I am yeah. a little closer to some than others. Yeah. Um, because time, now it's about time and geography. Sure. Um, not because of um, will and desire. Right. Um, but I don't think there was will or desire on either side for a long time. Mm -hmm. What what triggered the change? Like, what, why did it, how did that change? I got, look, there's I got, a lot of people. That, I got family clean, dynamics. I got clean and sober. Okay. I really. I, 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 I was yeah. I was uh, I, you know that you know the, that moment yeah. when you realize maybe you were the problem. <laughs> I have that shit happen all the time. You ever have this happen? No, I, I used to think they, they're, oh my God, they're so closed minded. They're so judgmental. They're yeah. so this, they're so that. Um, and the first time I went to, I went home for, I think it was Thanksgiving dinner. Yeah. And I went with a friend of mine. Right? Yeah. And I told Michael like this, okay, we're going to have a fight. We scream, we yell. Yeah. It's going to be a hot mess. Um, and if you feel uncomfortable, just tell me and we'll leave. And he goes, okay. We get there, we go through the whole dinner, and then on, on the drive back, he goes like this. You know, if you were all white, you would have been like a Norman Rockwell painting. And I was like, wow, he goes like this. You guys got like this perfect American, you know, scene at dinner. Everybody's so elegant, everybody's so courteous, and so everything. And I was like, I know, don't rub it in. And he goes, why? And I go like this. I just realized I've been the problem the whole time. Mm -hmm. And he goes, yeah, wow, I didn't think of that. And I was like, yeah. And, and it had been the drugs and the alcohol. Yeah. Yeah. Um, my fear, I guess, of them not accepting me. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I always needed to have something inside me, some, some yeah. crutch. And that crutch uh, was part of the problem. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not like we don't fight. You know, we yeah. don't have arguments. Um, like every family, mm -hmm. um, but it, it, it's not the 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 perception, yeah. the um, the myth yeah. that I had created because of uh, a few incidences that were events that really did happen. Right. They were interpreted through children's eyes, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I brought those childhood. You've been carrying that for years into years. my adulthood. Sure. Um, like my father was yeah. never a, a bad father. I used to tell my father, "My father doesn't care. You know, he's never been around me. He doesn't yeah. he ever." Uh, my father was working two or three jobs, <laughs> keeping me in Catholic school, keeping yeah. me clothed. Mm -hmm. um, so no, he wasn't around. Right. You know, but, so, was, but I was looking at it in his a, eyes. I, I was looking at it through a child's eyes. Right. You know, yeah. I don't have a father. I don't go to, go to Cub Scouts mm. with my father. I don't get to go to baseball with my yeah. father. I don't know how to play ball. I don't know. Um, and I hated him for that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, but as an adult, I mean, he's a saint. Yeah. <laughs> as a, as a he's man. an immigrant. He got here in his twenties. Yeah. He worked three jobs. He built a house for us. And, you know, experience and perspective. Right. It's so, so. Um, in the last five years, is there a new belief or perspective that you've adopted that has made a big impact or big change in your life? Some new belief or, or insight? It hasn't made an impact yet, but it will because okay. I'm working on it.
Wow. Tell and me. you reinforced that uh, <laughs> this weekend. Okay. Uh, and Kevin, your friend Kevin. Uh, portability. Uh, um, okay. Ten years yeah. ago, I thought that. <laughs> Are you referring to the fact that I live out of my backpack? <laughs> yes. Um, and I laughed when I when I, I did my background check on you, and I and I saw I, and I blew up the picture of your backpack and all your picture mints <laughs> online. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was like, you know, I used to have less than that, and really? I was happy. I'm impressed. And I yeah. was happy. Yeah. I mean, I went through prison yeah. for 10 years with three yeah. pairs of socks, two underwear, yeah. and, and a footlocker. Yeah, I know. Um, I, I was the same situation. And uh, I have mirrors. Mm -hmm. Tupperware. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I have, like, stuff, you know, that I don't need. <laughs> uh, it's amazing I, I have you 4, 000, I have a 4,000 square foot gallery. I have the largest yeah. gallery in, in, in Palm Beach County, and it's full. Yeah, I have an art studio. I have every size brush. I don't need every size brush. <laughs> I have a house that, that, and five years ago, I bought a house for the first time in my life. And I decided that what I wanted was to establish roots and stay one place. And so I bought a house, I established a life. And, and all of a sudden, it's like, um, for the last five years, I was like, you need to reduce, you need to reduce. Mm -hmm. um, you have a really big, heavy I footprint. I would encourage you to do that. You know, you it's have a, a really feeling. big, broad, heavy <laughs> footprint in this town. Yeah. And, um, if, and, it, and it's yeah. starting a little bit to feel like a ball and chain, Yeah, you yeah. know? Yeah. And I'm like, what if I want to do something else? What if, I, you know, this whole yeah. relationship thing that's going on in my head, what if yeah. you fall in love? <laughs> Are you going to attach this ball and chain to that person, or are you going to be able to create a new life and okay. be able to move? Well, you're going to have to keep me posted on this because so, yeah. this is an area that I. So really I think I'm going to have a yard sale this week. <laughs> it's wonderful. <laughs> Send me pictures. I, that will make me so happy. Um, I have I have three antique lamps that I'm that I'm going to rewire. I don't like antiques. I just, <laughs> um, I just, I just fell in love with the idea of refurbishing something that that is an antique. Yeah, yeah. and it's sitting there. Yeah, and I'm like, I got to donate that to somebody who, who really likes it. Yeah. yeah, gosh, this is a topic we can talk about forever. There's so much of the stuff that I, I we can just go yeah. on. But yeah, the the I think there's a I've had millions of dollars. I've had everything you could buy with money stuff. i've had all this stuff and i've gotten to the end of that road and been very disappointed with you know the fact that we're taught that that's the what's going to lead to all this joy and happiness i've been there and i'm yeah. like hmm it's not the answer that people think it is and then um and then having going through what i went through with prison too and having everything yeah. taken yeah and coming to realize i just real quick, I remember this experience I had in prison, and I think you'll relate with this. I came in from a run. Every All my worldly possessions are in this little locker, mm -hmm. you know, this four foot by two foot locker, literally everything I own in the world. I, I come in from a run. I'm about a few months from getting Your out. Your honey buns were in there? Huh? Honey buns? <laughs> no, I was not eating that. Mackerels? I was, not e I was eating a lot of mackerels, mackerels. fish. <laughs> and I was eating protein powder and different yeah, doing I, the I, best I, I could. I know, I, Eggs that were stolen from the kitchen, but don't say that. We're not supposed to say that. But <laughs> anyway, you know the drill. But anyway, yeah. I opened my locker and I saw all the goals I had accomplished. I, I saw, I had read 837 books. I had all of my reports on all these books. I've earned a master's degree while I was there. I did all these things. And I was standing there in prison, the happiest I had been ever in my life. Mm -hmm. And I didn't, and I didn't have a bunch of shit that I had to worry about because the more stuff you own, the more you got to maintain it, watch after it, the, you know, it becomes this albatross. And I was like, I was fascinated. I was like, how can it be possible that I'm standing in prison and I'm the happiest I've ever been in my life? <laughs> you know, and, and this is all I have. This is all I own. And I'm like full of happiness and joy. Like, right. so I can, I highly recommend that, um, people, um, test this theory of divesting yourself of a bunch of shit that we don't need. Yeah. The universe is true though. Some people like stuff and, and they feel comfortable with stuff. Um, and they may never have enough stuff. Um, because then, and that's part of their journey. Yeah. Sure. Um, it could um, have the been contrary, yeah, some, I, sure. I, I, I was not sure whether yeah. 
but I knew I hadn't tried settling down. Yeah, sure. I never, I had never settled down anywhere. Yeah. I think I have um, maybe seventy-two mailing addresses. <laughs> I mean, you know. Yeah. And and I'm only fifty-eight. <laughs> do the math. Do the math. And I spent a lot of time in prison with one single address. Uh, <laughs> wow. Yeah. But uh, you know, That's so good. so I tried the the the, the create roots. Maybe, yeah. you know, like you're trying to live in discovery. Maybe that's the problem. Yeah. Um, and what I realized, it's, it's nice to have a house. And don't get me wrong. It's nice to have a house, go in. I have my pets. Um, uh, but I'm, the idea of uh, being so rooted yeah. um, needs a little bit looking that's out. So uh, you know, I, I, I'm, keep sorry, keep I, I'm starting to feel a little keep me bit ball and chained, you know. <laughs> you don't have to go to an extreme like I am, but keep me posted. I'm very interested. But I'm thinking about maybe renting the house yeah. and keeping a bedroom in the house. <laughs> and me renting the room, you know. Uh, <laughs> Live your best life. I love it. Yeah. Okay. When you feel overwhelmed or stuck, okay, or you've lost your focus temporarily, what do you do? Or, you know, or maybe what questions do you ask yourself to break yourself, to get yourself unstuck or un back yeah. from that place? I do nothing. <clears throat> I do nothing. Um, I, if, if I'm in that position and I, and I do, I create that mess. Um, I create frustration. I create uh, uncertainty uh, because that's what the space I'm, I'm, I'm in. Uh, because so that's the state you're in. That's the state I'm you're in. You're unfocused. You're frustrated. Yeah, and I create that more. Okay. Yeah, I just exasperate it uh, because I, it, it's kind of like um, drowning. You just mm -hmm. if you just set, settle down, you float. Mm -hmm. But if you, you, you get all Flailing worked around, up and yeah. stuff, you'll drown. And yeah, um, and yeah I, I stop. And, um, and I go back to, to the habit of getting a piece of paper out and writing, what are the events? What are the things in my, in my head? Pair them down to the event. Um, kind of like when um, my mom died. Mm -hmm. What happened? I didn't even put "mom died," um, and, I, and I put three people died, mm -hmm. and then what the possible outcomes were in, in the conversations I was having. Um, and I was like, "Okay, that's normal. This is normal. That's not normal. This is normal." That's and then you say, "Not normal." What do you not, mean? not normal for me. Okay. Um, so that <clears throat> need looking at because okay. I'm responding in, in in a very strange way. Do you mean your response wasn't wasn't something that you were accustomed that I wanted, to? That I want to embrace. Okay, it wasn't serving. Me. Right. It wasn't. It's not going to get me to any any okay. where near where I need to go. Okay. Um, uh, so I was like, okay, so that needs to look at. Mm -hmm. Why am I interpreting it that way? Mm -hmm. um, fear. Mm -hmm. Mostly, it's impotence. Not having the power. Feeling powerless to, to powerless is the word that, that's used yeah, in recovery. Yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> and, and what I'd say is impotent mm -hmm. because I want to and I'm going to force it. I'm just not going to be able to do it. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And and I have to say, why am I doing that? What else is going on? Mm -hmm. um, well, COVID's going on. You don't have control of your income, the gallery, the clientele is older. This that. So it's everything is being built on to that. Yeah. That's saying give up. Mm. You know? Um, and it's like, but you don't want to give up. Mm -hmm. um, so you need to reinterpret COVID. Yeah. You need to reinterpret loss. Mm -hmm. And you need to find out where those things are supporting you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and how how you're looking at them because how you look at everything is, mm -hmm. that, that determines whether we feel it's good or bad. So I, I, you know how I say so I do nothing. I, I sit back and, and just chart it, and that's it. But I don't take any actions. I don't do anything. I just sit with with it. Yeah. Uh, 
until I could get it organized. Okay. I want to talk about a couple a couple topics, um, which we we could spend a lot of time on these because these are topics that I know that are near and dear to you and that you're very actively involved in. Um, zip lining. <laughs> zip lining sounds amazing. <laughs> that would be. That's not on my list, but when you suggested champagne you know, sunset on uh, 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 a hot air balloon. Okay, listen, you, you have. I was looking. I was stalking you on Instagram and uh, looking through your one of your pictures. You have this hat. It's it's great. It says "Make lying wrong again," um, and I, you know, it, you gotta always be careful about the political rabbit hole. But make what wrong? It again? says you're, there's a blue hat that says "Make lying wrong again." Oh, okay. <laughs> um, okay, now I want to talk about this. You became a delegate for Biden in 2020. Yes. Activism is very important. A to lot you. of beautiful things happened to me in 2020. I, and they were all anti cathartic because they were all done on Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> and I figured I better not, I, my wish yeah. for zip lining better not come through no, during the pandemic because they'll probably put me on a Zoom, a virtual Zoom thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, no, no thing. Yeah, yeah. No. But you've, you've been like, that's politics is be, and activism is important to you. Right. Tell me about like, well, I was not able to vote as you know, when you come out. Yeah. Um, right. so I've started volunteering, doing a lot of behind the scenes thing. Okay. Um, and I got my rights restored. Wonderful. Uh, and I, uh, started off, uh, uh, I have a lot of minority issues, yeah. Hispanic, gay, that's that, whatever. Um, so I got involved with Hispanic, um, uh, politics, I got involved in LGBT politics, um, instead of complaining, trying to mm -hmm. do something about it. Yeah. Uh, Putting your energy towards the solution. Towards the solution. Is uh, a big theme in your life. Yeah. And so I did, I got involved. Um, I was challenged <clears throat> quite a bit um, because of my background and I am aptly prepared to comment on prison reform, on prison industry, um, slave labor, mm -hmm. um, because I've Done yeah. it. Were you happy to see that yeah. the Biden canceled the renewal of contracts to private prison industries? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Prison yeah. for profit. I just can't. Well, the, the okay, the, how I said <laughs> Trump never really lied. <laughs> uh, when he said he was bringing in 30,000 jobs last year, uh, he brought 30,000 uh, 30, jobs in. Um, but they all went to Unicor. Me and you are probably familiar with that yeah, word. I worked at Unicor, a prison yeah. industry. Half of the half of America is, has no idea what Unicor is. No, they don't. They just know that 30,000 30, 30, 30, jobs came to the United States, and unemployment wasn't didn't make a dent on unemployment. So how did that happen? Yeah. Um, because it all went to undocumented workers that are doing prison time mm -hmm. and other other prisoners uh, slave labor we don't we don't allow the undocumented or yet to be documented people yeah. to work yeah if they're caught working we arrest them and then we put them to work anyway mm -hmm. and we give them the american jobs mm -hmm. you know uh, our air force bases so as you're you telling know, me those jobs were counted towards labor uh -huh. statistics. they were they were they're called reshoring jobs in, I in bringing that. back jobs we're bringing back jobs into the united States. and he was honest he he was telling the I truth think the prevailing wage for unicor is something uh, like two dollars 20, 25 cents to two dollars it ranges from 25 cents to two dollars depending on an hour. Uh, what facility that you're at yeah, yeah i think i was making 18 cents so i was below the yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, working in a laundry facility, yeah, yeah, yeah. eighteen cents an hour. Yep. Wow, um, I ran the shop, <laughs> <laughs> the, the wood shop. So, so you, you uh, tell me about being involved in as a delegate. What was that like, and how? how it was anti-cathartic. Okay. Uh, the dream is uh, to run the election. You run an election. You get elected. You canvas mm -hmm. uh because it doesn't come easy to be a delegate but you can't canvas during covid basically uh, right? but you promote you yourself promote. online and people yeah. vote and there's a big vote and everything and then you prepare to go to wisconsin and you got your plane tickets you got your badges you got mm -hmm. your signs made you got your committees and it's everything exciting. and then they cancel it <laughs> they put it online um, and it was all done uh online yeah, yeah. Uh, so I, um, I, I attended the conference in boxer shorts and a dress shirt with a tie on. 
okay. uh, because it was it was you. <laughs> oh, <gosh. laughs> and uh, that's, that's why why am I going to get dressed up if I'm going to be on on my so from here up I had the, my nice little tie and my little convention pin. But on the bottom, I had my my sleeping shorts or my pajama pants on <laughs> through the whole thing, um, and that's the way uh, most things went this yeah. last year. Okay. Uh, Do you, is there a specific cause? You, we were talking in the car about a cause that's really near and dear to you right now. What is your current focus as far as the cause that you're really focused on? Um, <clears throat> We have um, adopted a couple of extra letters to LGBT, Q, A, I. Um, we've always had LGB, gay, lesbian, and bisexual. Um, and then we, our community's um, tagline is unity in the community. And it sounds real pretty. Um, as an exclam exclamatory statement, you know, unity in the community, um, as if we were working for it. And I, um, I want to put a big question mark at the end of it and do some major house cleaning uh, in the next couple of years okay. um, to question uh, whether there's unity in our community, um, whether we are there for each other. Uh, my last exhibition was purposely given to an ally to a non-LGBT person uh, in exchange for that person's support of our community, mm -hmm. I decided to celebrate him, um, straight black man, mm -hmm. um, who created a comic book that introduced the first transgender uh, Not really. wow. comic character in a graphic novel. Mm -hmm. um, and very few people showed up. Mm. Mm. Okay. Um, so if we can't, as a community, you mean from the community or from the gay community to have more support for that? Yes, yeah. I got it. Um, and we need to realize that when we ask people to show their support for us, that we in turn have to show our support to them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that that's going to be. So there's some more, still a lot, a long ways to go in that in that regard. Yeah. Okay. Um, I know now again, we, art has been a huge part of your life and like we could, there's so much that I could talk to you about there. I, I want to read a quote that you, that I really love that you said when you were talking, <laughs> this is, no, I, like I said, I stopped, uh -oh, you. Uh -oh. but this is a great, great quote. And I want to yeah. talk about implications of this quote. You said, I think people are starting to recognize that art is powerful and that the title artist is a way of living a hundred percent of the time. Mm -hmm. And not only in the studio, we paint, we draw, we create installations, but we also hit the streets. We petition, we protest, we create the change that we want to see. So do you see, are you saying you see art and activism basically hand in hand? That, I think it informs like, the art and um, activism informs the art. Art informs activism. Um, both are mutually uh, in, independent and mm -hmm. mutually interdependent. Um, and it's for me, uh, for other people would be, they walk in beauty, they like uh, modern design, they like waterfalls and they paint them. Mm. Um, so their whole life, um, they're translating things and interpreting things through artist's yeah. eyes. Yeah. Uh, and how is it? Everything is autobiographical. Um, even if I'm here painting a portrait of you, mm -hmm. I am painting my, my version of you in my given place and time. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it is a page in my journal. I see. Yeah. It's what I did today. Today yeah. I painted you. So in my journal, it is my work. Mm -hmm. It's my autobiography that I'm, that I'm doing. Mm -hmm. Um, and you might think I'm doing a portrait of you, but no, it's an extension of, of my, my journal. Um, this is not your interview. This is the interview 
as part of my autobiography. Sure. Um, yeah. Because it's a it's a date. It has a time. It has a schedule. <clears throat> it's on the calendar, um, <clears throat> and it will be part of my my life. Um, uh, although. Yeah, it's, we're know, creating so, it so that's what I'm saying. Sure. If um, I can't stop being gay because I'm here, I don't turn that off. Yeah, it's a way of being. Sure, I can't turn off being Hispanic. Um, right. I can't. Yeah, um, and I can't stop you from seeing brown. <laughs> um, and my classifying myself as white because, I'm, uh, according to other Hispanics, I'm white. <laughs> you know, uh, and and yeah. According, um, so none of that changes. None of that changes. When I read your, when I read that yeah. quote that you said, um, I, you know, what I immediately thought of was, you see in totalitarian regimes, you know, when they come into power, usually one of the first things that they do is start burning the books. They start gathering up the creative thinkers, the artists, and stuff like that, and and the artwork. And the artwork, literally, yeah, yeah, literally, literally grabbing the artwork, but also the artists and the creative minds behind it, and they start closing that down, homogenizing, you know, and like so. I was, I wanted to ask you, like, what do you think in the role of art in in a in a society, like, in for example, in our school systems, a lot uh, a lot of funding has been taken away from the arts and focused towards other core things that. People, certain people have decided that are. Did you ever go out of your way to go to a museum to look at um, math equations? <laughs> no, exactly. Do you ever remember? No, that's going? my point. Like, yeah. it's like if if we don't. Um, but you have gone to see buildings that are beautiful. Like, if you okay. would go see a Frank Lloyd sure. Wright building or Bauhaus design building, mm -hmm. and, so, and that's the application of the mathematics. Yeah, right. You could have your core. <clears throat> things um but it's the art that's it's the creative, expression of the uh, of the, those formulas that we remember yeah uh and that we treasure um yeah good design good painting uh, good storytelling so where do you see um I mean, we, and we can kind of like i, I want to end on this note because you've done so many things in the in, in your artistic career you've been at it for 40 plus years you worked with all sorts of different mediums. You worked in film. You worked, you know, you, you worked in all different places. Um, but where do you see yourself? Where are you focused now artistically, and where do you see yourself moving into in the near future? Like, what, what, what is what's important to you? And what's driving you? What's your focus right now? Um, I don't know. That's an honest answer. Yeah, I, I don't know. Um, yeah. Is it creating I don't, I don't events? Because you've done so much yeah, of that. I don't know like, if, I'm, if I'm catching up because of COVID and trying to fill in what I what we missed. The dynamic of losing a whole year has never happened. Mm -hmm. And it's been very unsettling. Yeah, There's been a lot of cancellations, a lot of postponements mm -hmm. that have moved all of the plans uh, apart. And in my business, there's a lot of planning because there's one, two years planning to put a show together, um, to coordinate artists, venues, and everything. Um, there have been postponements that when you postpone something, you're replacing something, moving something else. Mm -hmm. So it's a domino effect. Um, so right now, it's um, my next show is um, what's in front of me. I'm leaving here today mm -hmm. and I'm running to Miramar uh, okay. for a, an exhibition that opens tomorrow in, uh, that's called In Time of Protest. Mm -hmm. um, and then I go back home on Sunday mm -hmm. and start coordinating Blank Slate uh, with Dominic uh, Esposito, uh, who is the gentleman that did uh, the Purdue uh, pharmaceutical intervention with the Purdue family oh. with the giant heroin spoon. He did that. Yes. Wow. And he has a whole new series of works uh, <laughs> that we're coordinating a national um, round table around yes. uh, about uh, mental health. Do, do you do you only choose, is it your preference and choice to only be involved in art that has an underlying Social justice, yes. Yeah, because that's the theme I'm picking. <laughs> Everybody up needs a niche. Why not that one? I um, mean, all of your art 
has it my whole you've been life. doing this for 40 years my and whole, it started like way yeah. back in the gay community with, yeah. with the redlining and that's yeah. where the activism started so yeah. your art is my life an expression yeah. of, of my life it's a mirror of my life okay yeah um how i said i brought <clears> up the the cultural thing about how how we tend to judge other countries really easily and okay. um uh, when i was in school uh and I always bring up this yeah. um, female circumcision was like all the outrage. And, you know, this is before Facebook. Before Facebook, we would get outraged on uh, in classrooms and, mm -hmm. and, and amphitheaters and yeah. things like that. And, oh my God, female circumcision, some other stuff. And I did huge painting. It's like mural sized painting of a depiction of a circumcision. Talk, you know, illustrating. This is mutilation. This is body mutilation. The same way. This is done, we are interpreting this for sanitation purposes, and they're interpreting that for religious purposes. Um, but hasn't this been also religious purposes for, for a, a sector of, of the Jewish community? Yeah, sure. Uh, and it's mutilation. Yeah. Um, if you want to interpret it as such, mm -hmm. or you could say, this is what they do. Mm -hmm. This is what they do. Yeah. And don't add loaded words like mutilation, right, wrong, yeah. good and bad. Yeah. And and start backing off mm -hmm. um, from being the the moral high grounds of the world. Yeah. Uh, and I think that that's um, we're going through a a balancing mm -hmm. right now. Um, as we get into more of the technology state. Uh, world and we have access to more of the world through the computer we get to see how similar how different and how equal we really are in mm -hmm. some areas how underdeveloped we are in certain areas mm -hmm. and how overdeveloped we are in other areas yeah. as compared to other countries and other places um, because some of us won't, won't get the opportunity to travel and see it for ourselves mm -hmm. um, it's one of the things i love about travel being able to kind of show a window into yeah Amazing you go, people and places. Mm -hmm. and Most people think that anything <laughs> south of the border is a third world country. Mm -hmm. um, they it's too pleasantly bad, surprised it's too when America. they walk into uh, it, it really, places like uh, Buenos Aires or Uruguay yeah. and they see that it's like a European town with all this, uh, yeah. you know, riches. It's and, really yeah. interesting and unfortunate, in my opinion, how little travel Americans do when they're young. Like in a lot of other countries, the they have a tradition, you finish, you know, what would be equivalent yeah. of high school, you go on a yeah. backpacking tour for a year or something, you go, you know, and yeah. kind of see the world, but... Um, well, the down thing <laughs> of access to language is also um, America first, uh, mm -hmm. English first, <laughs> yeah. um, and we're, yeah. right. we have Mexico, and we, we, very few of us speak Spanish, we have Mexico on one border. And we have Canada on, on the northern side, even though Canadians speak primarily English. Well, but they English also have French. <laughs> you also have yeah. French. Yeah. Um, yeah. And we we we're not surrounded yeah. by different countries like in Europe, right? Or right, right. Right. you can literally travel 20, 30 minutes, and, and it's a different another language, language and yeah. crossing the border. And I yeah. go to I go to France, and I get away with. Although uh, when you get into the, deep, when you get into, the, I get, I, you know, I get to say I'm hungry, I want to eat, or I need to go to the bathroom, and then they laugh and they go like this. You don't speak French too well, and I'm like, no, and they're like, what do you, what do you speak? And I'm like, I'm Spanish, and they speak fluent Spanish too. Oh, Most yeah. French know Spanish, yeah. So we get to we get to choose a language, and mm -hmm. the idea is to communicate. Yeah, yeah. you know, and, and it's not a hierarchy. If my language is better than yours. Yeah. Um, and it's not a threat. It, it, it's about I getting to know each other. To me, what's so beautiful about yeah. art and the way that you're doing it is that you're communicating ideas and powerfully without yeah. saying words, right. often, depending yeah. on the medium that you're using, but yeah. but that art can... It's a universal thing. Yeah, it can. Yeah. you can look at different types of artwork mm -hmm. and it doesn't matter what language you speak you can actually understand you know the meaning that art can transcend you know yeah. so many barriers that you know if you were we yeah. were trying to communicate we didn't speak the same language it might be yeah. difficult but yeah so and me and you could go visit socalo <laughs> in mexico the big uh -huh. uh, 
big plaza. Yeah. Uh, I think it's second to Tinnaman or it's Tinnaman Red and then Socalo. I think it's the third. I think I thought they were flipped, but okay. I, I think it's uh, I think yeah. And watch a mime show. Yeah. And not speak a lick of Spanish. And get it. And get it. And, yeah. then, and then walk away and find out that they were Russian yeah. ma mimes. <laughs> you know? I <laughs> uh, think we thought all this time we were so. watching a couple of Russian mimes in Mexico City. Yeah. And thinking they were miming something in Spanish. Yeah. And we realized, no, they were just mimes. Yeah. You know, yeah. And, and it's universal. Um, and... I want to give you. I want to give you the floor to just uh, in, in closing. Um, I want to open the floor to you to talk about whatever you want. And I, I, I guess it's been so fascinating getting to know you and just seeing. I'll, I'll tell you what, like the things that you've been through in your life and how you've, how you've come back from those things. And we have some of those things in common and some of our experiences. But I just think it's really powerful to. The vulnerability a that you have to open yourself up we talked about that earlier i think that's absolutely critical because people need to know that it's okay to struggle mm -hmm. it's okay to face things that you don't know how you're going to get get yeah. through it's okay to feel fear we all feel fear yeah. that's universal nobody goes through life without feeling fear and and but you know being stuck and we've all been there but being stuck in in where you, you don't feel you can move forward. Um, a lot of times it helps to see people that have come through it. Mm -hmm. People that have like maybe been, even if it's not the exact same situation, right. I know this person, like I know Rolando has been through some really challenging things, but yeah. look at, look at his life, look at what he's doing, you know, and how did you do that? So if you could just maybe, I want to open the floor to you to, to just in closing, to talk about whatever you want, but like yeah. with that in mind, you know, how would you help somebody that's in that situation? Like, what I, would you... I um, there's no right, wrong, good or bad. There really isn't. Um, we create right, wrong, good and bad. Um, and it either works for us or doesn't work for us. Um, when you get to redirect. What we can't afford, um, there's only one great loss in life, is apathy. Um, if you become apathetic, you, you've lost everything. Um, sometimes it's not about the journey, sometimes it is about the destination, so get there. Um, sometimes it's all about the journey and take your time. Um, but it, it, how you think about it is how you're going to create it. Um, so be careful about, uh, be mindful about how you're processing information. Uh, and that's it. And, and just don't let apathy ever win. I, I lived in that space um, for too many years. And you had mentioned what were some, some of my regrets. Um, pushing people away, fear of uh, relationships, and apathy. Um, when nothing matters, um, there's no joy, there's no sorrow, there's no pain, there's no hope, there's no happiness. Um, there's no world. You just yeah. lose all, you've lost feeling, you've lost yeah. that feeling of feeling alive, really. Yeah, and that's why there's uh, mm. telephone poles on, uh, telephones on the Golden Gate Bridge and on the... We drove by one of them last yeah. night on the Skyway Bridge. I think that's what that's that why was. There's, that's why there's phone booths there. So yeah, that, um, people that are... You could say your goodbyes or you could wow. ask for help for that's the last right. time. Wow. Um, but apathy is the biggest killer of... Mm of progress, of joy, of life. Mm -hmm. For somebody who's feeling mm -hmm. that, what would you say to them? Get help. And that's where the vulnerability comes in. Okay. Um, learn that everybody needs something. Yeah. Um, there's no perfect human being. Mm -hmm. There's no perfect human being. And, there's, and, and we're all perfect. We're all perfect and there is no perfect. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. 
I, um, everybody has something. Everybody has something. Um, whether it's a kind touch, um, a twinkle in their eye, um, or being able to spin gold out of hay. But everybody has a gift. Um, and apathy will kill all that. All the dreams, all the desire. Um, and we need everybody. Yeah. I think like people feel apathetic when they lose hope mm-hmm. a lot of times. And I think one of the things that's helped me, and I, I love your perspective on this, is is realizing that everything is seasonal. So if you're in that place where things are really, really dark and you can't see light, and I think we've all been there, just realize that you're in a winter state. But after winter comes spring. Mm-hmm. It's not going to be winter all, forever, although mm-hmm. sometimes it feels like that. Because we can, you know, we can be in some pretty dark. Autumn spring. is about vulnerability, losing all your leaves and exposing yourself. Yeah, like there's a, <laughs> remember there's, that spring will come and you'll get a, that you'll get another yeah. another facade that you'll need to to do away <laughs> That's with. That's very interesting. Like, you know? that, yeah, I never thought about that, but yeah. you know, like just learning that you know the life is seasonal, yeah. challenges are seasonal. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not a permanence feeling that something is absolutely permanent and pervasive that it affects every area of your life and it's never going to change and mm-hmm. feel you know I, I see people um, get caught in that sometimes yeah. but um, it's not isn't it? like we're <clears throat> don't be scared um, and I, I try to tell people changes is, is change is difficult and, yeah, but it's and constant, right? It's one of the only constants right. in life. It's like it's, um, everything you're, we're accustomed to doing one thing, okay? I'm accustomed to using my right hand. It's no longer serving me. So I need to start learning how to use my left hand. It's not the dominant hand. It's unnatural for me. But I'm going to start writing. And I really want something. And I'm going to write it. It's going to look messy. But the more I, I try it, the more I practice, the more I, I go towards, the clearer it becomes until I, I finally master it. It is unnatural. This is what's natural. I love to sit in, and in vulgar terms, I love to sit in my shit because it's comfortable, it's warm, and it's a familiar smell. <laughs> yeah. This is uncomfortable. I don't recognize it. Um, people write books like fear of flying, this and that, fear of success. And then we quit, you know, but we kept getting on the horse, but we forget to ride it. Mm. We fall off the horse. They say, Oh, get back on the horse. You can get back on the horse 10,000 times. And you could say, well, at least every time I fall, I get back on the horse. But how does that serve you unless you take that horse somewhere mm-hmm. when you get back on the horse ride it for god's sakes <laughs> you know it's not just about getting but, back on the horse you know i think about like when you're talking about that i think about the need how important it is to have a a, a compelling vision mm-hmm. you know there's in scriptures it talks about like where the people lack vision they perish like yeah like how important is it to have something compelling that you wake up every morning and you're excited like yeah. you have this compelling thing that you're working towards and i think that's a key element yeah. is to have some some sort of compelling future that you're something that's exciting enough to you right. and motivating enough to you to to give you that well my life and your life um right now um if you put a day's worth of your travel experiences and the people that you come in contact with in God, I wish I could do that with everybody. Just and, 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 and people will will say that's impossible, <laughs> you know, because there's drama every day. Every day, every day, there's drama, and and it's beautiful, you know. And you were, you like my, yesterday, when my, you when my mother up, when my mother passed up. away, when my mother passed away, I was like, yeah. I go like this. What was the weirdest thing about it? I was like, there's yeah. no drama. Mm. She was sitting there. Got it. There was no catharsis, no drama. She didn't. Yeah. She, she transitioned. From living to dead in the same condition all day long. We live with drama. Mm. And I thrive on drama. You know, 
I went to school during the day. I went to uh, my studio at night. I went clubbing. And then I bartended. There was always drama, you know, in their stories. Um, and we create stories. We fill in blanks. In that. And then all of a sudden you realize nobody will believe the life that I've lived. It's just too many things. Um, just yesterday, you know, going, I went down and went cross across the state to visit someone I didn't know, ended up going down a dark street, going into a private house, not knowing anybody walked in and there was a guy and I painted been, gold, I <laughs> you know, covered in gold, you're co covered in gold leaf and, you know, yeah, and, then, photo shoot. and then, um, <laughs> we went and we did an interview the next day in some, <laughs> in another place. And, and then I'm, uh, we're going to, uh, a circus museum. And they're like, a circus museum? No, 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 Ringling, because Kevin interpreted Ringling Museum as the circus museum. And it's not a circus museum, it's an actual art gallery, an art collection. And it's hysterical because we get to, if we write that, that's just one 12 hours. There's so much magic and randomness and yeah, allowing things. Yeah, to, but that's 12 hours. Yeah. Yeah, 12 hours. You've lived that's your true. life, you're, you've lived your life recently like that. And I've lived my life almost 100% like that. Yeah. Yeah. We put it all down, um, you know, like they go like this, oh my God, what did you go to prison for? Well, I was an interpreter. Well, for who? And I tell them the stories of, of those interactions and people go like this, wow. <laughs> and I'm like, if I put it in a book, I'd have to call it fiction for yeah. people to pick it up. It's like, because it's stranger than fiction kind of thing. Yeah, because yeah. And it, it's just too much. And, uh, the parting, the drug use, the, the, the craziness, it's, it's, it's well, I could talk with you for hours and this has been so wonderful just to have this time with you. And yeah. I, there's so much more that I'm sure we're going to be able to talk about. But <laughs> I want to thank you so much for your time and <laughs> for coming out and like, you're welcome and meeting a stranger yeah. and like having the experiences we've had already. And yeah. It's just been a joy to get to know you. And, and, uh, and I look, forward to our next adventure yes absolutely